Uh, let me first introduce myself. I'm Xue Ping Ong. Uh, unlike most of the people here, I'm a material scientist. I'm not a physicist, and I certainly do not develop um, uh, ab initio codes. Uh, I'm a user of ab initio codes, so I really appreciate the work that uh, everyone here is doing. Uh, so, um, basically, what my talk today will be is on how we are actually using the uh, results from ab initio calculations to really speed up uh, material science uh, using machine learning. So, um, I, don't, I think I don't need to say this, but um, basically, uh, because of the efforts of uh, people like yourselves uh, uh, and the Ebonit uh, group, uh, today's the electronic structure code is uh, very uh, fairly reliable, at least compared to 10, 20 years ago. Um, and uh, there are actually a lot of interesting materials properties that we have computed and we, uh, that, that, that can be computed, and we have seen this uh, over the past uh, uh, few talks. Now, um, so with um, reliability, uh, we can then begin to do high throughput computations. I think this is basically uh, the uh, topic of uh, tomorrow's session. Uh, I'm not going to talk too much about that. Uh, I'm just going to say that uh, once we actually are able to do high throughput, we can build uh, fairly large databases. And I'm one of the uh, founding developers of the Materials Project. Uh, some of you may be familiar with it. Essentially, this is a big database of inorganic crystals. Uh, Today, there's about 133,000 uh, materials that are in the materials project. Uh, we have the energies and structures for uh, all of them. We have about half of them. We have uh, completed band structure calculations. And uh, we also have properties like the elastic constants, piezoelectric tensors. We are also calculating uh, dielectric constants as well. And I think people, uh, Jafar uh, Hortier from, uh, as well as John Marco from the Ebonic group is actually doing things like phonon spectra and uh, that sort of thing. Now, um, the big problem here, uh, I'm going to show you this chart, uh, which is going to set out why I think machine learning is important. Okay? So this is basically a history of the materials project. And we are, we are already one of the largest databases of uh, computer calculations out there. Um, so, the red line is basically the baseline, which is all the materials, uh, basically everything that we have energies for. Um, today, we are already hitting about 10 to the power of 5 uh, materials, okay? Um, the blue line is basically band structures, but what you initial, uh, basically see is that there are a lot of properties where we really do not have that much data, okay? Even with high throughput computations, uh, we are only progressing extremely slowly on the elastic tensors. Uh, even today, we, we barely just pass about 10,000 uh, uh, crystal structures with elastic tensors uh, just a few months ago. Uh, before that, we only have a few thousand uh, elastic tensors. Now, um, basically, once you get past the 1,000 data point stage, you can begin to do some reasonable machine learning, okay? Uh, and uh, you, you can, of course, do it with uh, less than that. You can do it with uh, hundreds of data points. But uh, if you really want fairly robust models that can apply across broad chemistries, uh, you really want to be at least at the 1,000 data points or above mark. Uh, and if you are really into deep learning, where you are do, do using things like neural networks and that sort of thing, you really want to be beyond even the 10 to the power of 4 point, uh, basically at least 10,000 data points and above, or even more. Okay? Now, now um, even though we have enough, uh, we have quite substantial data on a, a number of materials, um, the materials design space is actually combinatorial. Okay? So I'm going to just give a naive uh, example. Of, obviously, I'm not taking into account symmetry or anything. Uh, if you just think about a double perovskite and you simulate it with a 2x2x2 two by two by two supercell, uh, you have 10 types of A species and 10 types of B species. Uh, essentially, we, we are already talking about 10 to the power of 7 structures that you essentially have to more or less evaluate uh, for that kind of application. Now, uh, people are not just looking at double-double perovskites. They are looking at uh, things like high-entropy perovskites, where we are really talking about five species in uh, one site. Okay? So uh, that's the kind of scale, uh, combinatorial scale problem that we need to look at. Okay? Um, so obviously, DFT calculation is not going to get us there. No matter how much improvement we have in computing power, we are basically not going to get there. So 
essentially what we want to do is to be able to predict the at least some of the basic properties for a material at least almost instantaneously okay once we have enough dft calculations to actually train the model on we want to be able to just say i want to snap my finger and i can at least get the estimate of the energy all right now um we can do this today. Uh, I'm going to show you a recent uh, thing that we have developed in my group, which is called the Materials Graph Network. Uh, essentially, um, graphs are a fairly good representation of uh, materials. Okay? We always think about materials in terms of atoms and uh, the bonds between atoms. So essentially, if you think of them in terms of graphs, essentially the atoms are the vertices or nodes of the graph and the bonds are the edges. Okay? Um, graph networks are essentially a, a deep learning model that was developed by DeepMind, uh, uh, which is a subsidiary of Google, where essentially um, you, 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 you basically create, uh, represent each of the atoms and bonds and also a global state using a vector of uh, attributes. Okay? Now, uh, in the graph network, essentially you go through update steps where you update the bond attribute, update the atom attributes and the uh, uh, state attributes using uh, sequential updates. Uh, these are the update functions. I'm not going to go into too much of them. And essentially, what you create is a new graph. Okay. Now, uh, the, the the update functions themselves are implemented using neural networks. And essentially, what this comprises of is basically one uh, graph network block. Okay. Now, uh, by stacking multiple of these uh, graph network blocks and uh, adding some uh, other uh, features uh, in the top and bottom, essentially, uh, what you can do is that you create a, a full uh, what we call a materials graph network model. Okay, so and then you use your standard techniques of uh, backpropagation to basically train your neural networks and update the weights and give it enough data. Let's say you have ten thousand data points and you train the model. Uh, basically, uh, you then uh, develop a full model for a particular materials property. Okay, now um, I just want to uh, highlight that uh, we. As per what, we, uh, what my group usually does, all our codes are all open source. So in, if you actually want to play around with the graph network model, uh, it's actually on GitHub. Okay? Now, to show you uh, why we think this is uh, a potentially interesting thing uh, for, for uh, material scientists, uh, so this is a performance of, on, of the models that we have developed on the QM9 dataset, which comprises of 130,000 uh, uh, molecules. Uh, we basically show that uh, in terms of a broad range of properties from the things like the internal energy at 0k, 298k, enthalpy, Gibbs set free energy, uh, the heat capacity, the homo lumo levels, uh, we essentially achieve uh, state-of-the-art accuracy. Okay? We do much better than uh, any of the previous models out there. Um, in fact, the accuracy is uh, good enough that it's actually to, uh, can, can be considered to be within uh, chemical accuracy. Essentially is uh, uh, within the accuracy that you think uh, the error that DFT is going to give you, okay? Uh, at least standard uh, PBE DFT, okay? Um, we, beyond that, um, we also uh, show that basically you can uh, develop models which are physically intuitive. So we do not just want to develop models one by one, and we, we, we actually, uh, using the global state attributes of the uh, materials graph network, we can actually develop a unified free energy model where we basically stipulate that a particular free energy is of some function of energy, temperature, and whether there is pressure and entropy involved. And we basically can train the models to basically reproduce um, all the free energies, basically the uh, entropy at zero, uh, the the internal energy at 0k and 298k, the enthalpy at, and Gibbs free energy at, uh, at room temperature uh, using uh, just a single model alone. Okay? Now this is uh, very, very important because it, what it means is that we can actually consolidate uh, data. So we now have four types of data, 130,000 data points each. So essentially we have half a million data points rather than just 100, 130,000 data points. Okay? Uh, we do see, still see some interpolation problems. Uh, I, we believe that this is basically the, because uh, there is no data in between uh, at any temperature in, bet in between 0K and room temperature. And definitely this is a problem that we believe w can be solved uh, if we actually um, expand, uh, increase the data size, uh, data coverage uh, to these temperatures. Okay? Now, on crystals, uh, this is basically the... Um, 
a model train just uh, on la uh, last year. Last year we only have 69,000 uh, crystals, not uh, 133,000. And we basically show that again we can achieve uh, very, very low errors in the formation energies, about 28 MeV per atom. Uh, that is good enough for uh, a lot of applications. And uh, we can also predict things like band gap uh, and the uh, bulk modulus and uh, shear modulus. Okay? Um, what we will notice is that basically the data sets for um, the band gap and the uh, bulk and shear modulus are much smaller. So remember the graph that I initially showed you, that there is actually much less data for these than uh, compared to the formation energies. Okay? So uh, we show that basically um, we can actually do what is known as transfer learning in the, uh, uh, in, in the field of uh, machine learning, where we essentially uh, take a model which is trained on something like the formation energy with lots and lots of data. We uh, cut out the uh, piece that we want. So in this case, we just want the uh, elemental embeddings. I'm going to show you what the ele elemental embeddings is uh, soon enough. We transfer it to something like the band gap model. And then we, we attach, uh, uh, we, we attach a, a new set of uh, blocks uh, below it, and then we retrain the model. And essentially what we can do is that we can significantly speed up the convergence of the model as well as uh, lower the uh, error in the, um, in the predictions. Okay? So this is for, for the band gap model, the error decreased by about 0 0.06, uh, and uh, convergence is actually uh, almost twice as fast. Okay? Now, a common criticism of uh, machine learning models is, of course, that people always say, well, you, it, it is a black box, you don't see anything, uh, we, don't know, we don't understand any physics or chemistry from it. Uh, I don't think that that is true, okay? So, basically, um, from our model, we, we actually extract what are known as, known as the ele elemental embeddings. These are basically um, a 16, 16 length vector that encodes each element which the machine has automatically learned. Okay? We did not actually put anything in there. Okay? And after, the, after we have finished converging the model, we, we then <laughs> plotted the um, Pearson correlation coefficient of this 16-bit vectors for each of the elements versus each other. And what we, lo and behold, what we found was that essentially we, we reproduced the periodic table. Okay? So the machine has somehow learned that well, alkaline metals should be similar to one another, alkaline earth metals should be similar to one another, the rare earth should be all together, and uh, we can actually uh, show this in a, a 2D projection of uh, the uh, ele elemental embeddings as well. Okay? Now, this is actually very, very useful information, meaning that if I know how to encode things like the elements, we can also encode things like the species, including an oxidation state, uh, such information can then be transferable between models. Okay? Essentially, we are learning chemistry in a very quantitative manner rather than uh, just using uh, chemical intuition. Okay? Now, uh, we have actually developed this website. I'm going to uh, show a quick demo of it. Okay? Uh, it's basically called Crystals AI. Um, in, in this website, basically, oops, this is the actual website. Okay? In this website, essentially what we have is that we have uh, various uh, models that we have uh, built web applications around. Uh, I'm going to show you how we use this one. Uh, in case you are interested in developing your own, there are actually multiple tools out there today that uh, people have uh, written software frameworks like uh, the Materials Graph Network as well as uh, Arnabaf, uh, my colleague, actually developed MapMiner for uh, doing other forms of machine learning. There are other graph-based uh, machine learning models as well. And uh, this is the most important. We actually provide you with full data sets in which you can use to train your own uh, models as well as to develop, uh, to test your model against uh, ours. Okay? Now, uh, I'm going to show you basically uh, the, uh, the first thing, which is this uh, MACNEC model. So, uh, so essentially, this is a web application which is running our materials graph network uh, that allows you to basically predict the property of uh, any given material uh, given either a materials project ID. Okay, I'm going to show you the materials project ID solution. Uh, so 
this is basically the predictions from our neural, uh, materials graph network models. This is basically what the materials project has calculated using uh, density functional theory calculations. And uh, you see that the agreement is actually extremely good, okay, uh, compared to, uh, and this model, of course, uh, does it uh, very, very quickly. Now, this is, of course, uh, only of limited use. Since we train on the materials project data, we will expect it to be uh, good. Uh, you can also upload a SIF or POSCAR file and then uh, click predict and they will actually predict it for uh, any given structure as well. Okay. Now, uh, having demonstrated that, I'm going to just quickly go through the... Oops. Let me... Yeah, I just have uh, uh, two, three more slides. Um, so, um, the other reason why we want to do machine learning is to basically build uh, um, uh, potential models to basically uh, allow us to access scale which we cannot uh, access before, okay, for many, many different kind of applications which are not related to bulk crystals, okay. Uh, essentially, what we want to get is linear scaling but with close to ab initial accuracy, okay. Now, there's a fairly well known procedure to do this. Uh, basically, you sample a large enough data set, you describe the local environment, uh, those descriptors must be uh, must satisfy certain uh, invariances like uh, rotation, translation, reflection, as well as permutation. You want them to be unique and differentiable. Uh, people have developed uh, a, a number of these descriptors. And then you basically use some machine learning model to learn the, uh, the relationship between the energy force and basically all these descriptors. Okay? Um, the model that we have chosen is basically uh, this uh, bispectrum coefficient, which is essentially sort of like the photo transform of the in, uh, atomic density around each atom, okay? And uh, by expressing the energy and forces as a linear model of this uh, bispectrum coefficients, we can basically fit a model. We have developed a high throughput framework in which to do this. And basically what we can show is that uh, we can achieve um, very, very low errors compared to at least traditional interatomic potentials such as EAM uh, uh, in terms of uh, predicting the energy forces as well as the elastic constants of uh, uh, these uh, materials, okay? Now, to show you what uh, a, a key application of this is basically, uh, we actually are able to reproduce the finite temperature phase diagram from a MCMD simulation. This is basically 4,000 atom simulation, okay? This is basically what the experimental uh, phase diagram is. This is what EAM gives you. Basically, you see that uh, EAM significantly overestimates the nickel solubility in molybdenum, okay? And with the uh, new uh, uh, potential, we can actually basically get almost close to um, the accuracy that you can get uh, from experiments, okay? And this is completely just from a model that is trained uh, from DFT calculations, okay? Um, we can also look at things like, for example, the hall patch relationship. Uh, this is actually a simulation of half a million atoms. We can reproduce the inverse hall patch regime and the uh, normal hall patch regime. And we can also do things like uh, high entropy alloys. This is basically a very, very new result. We can uh, basically build potentials which actually have four components, five components, or even more uh, with very, very low errors and do uh, big simulations of thousands of atoms uh, to look at the microstructure properties of uh, these materials. Okay? Um, to conclude, uh, basically, uh, by having large data sets, uh, DFT generated data sets with uh, machine learning, we uh, can do property prediction, we can learn new chemistry, and we can also access uh, much larger length and uh, time scales. Thank you.